All right. Hello, everyone on the internet, and welcome to today's event on the Sci-Fi Feedback Loop, uh, the first in a series of events as part of the Applied Sci-Fi Project from Arizona State University's Center for Science and the Imagination, uh, a project that's being supported by the Sloan Foundation. Thanks, Sloan. Um, that intro raises some question, questions. What is CSI? What is Applied Sci-Fi? And who am I? Um, well, the Center for Science and the Imagination uh, brings writers and artists and other creative thinkers into collaboration with scientists, engineers, and technologists to help us build a better future by giving us the tools to imagine better futures. Um, applied sci-fi is what we call sci-fi when it's used as such a tool for thinking about and shaping the future. There are various ways that sci-fi storytelling can be deliberately used as a tool to aid in technology design and strategic foresight, and future events in this series will deal with those modes of applied sci-fi. But today, we're focusing, focused on examining the unintentional or natural influence of sci-fi on the people who read it or watch it and are inspired by it. Um, uh, Self-disclosure, I'm one of those people. Um, I was inspired by sci-fi to build my career around technology, law, and policy. Uh, I worked at nonprofits like the ACLU and the Electronic Frontier Foundation for a couple of decades. And more recently, I joined Meta to lead responsible AI policy there. Uh, that said, I'm not wearing my Meta hat today. I'm wearing my hat as a research fellow here at CSI, running this applied sci-fi project to look deeper at sci-fi influence, which is a topic that our several expert panelists are super expert on. So let me briefly turn to each of them. I will give a brief introduction and ask them, what is your favorite example or anecdote of sci-fi influence? So let's start with Michael G. Bennett. He's the director of student experiential immersion programs at the Discovery Partners Institute of the University of Illinois. Um, and he is a specialist in amongst other things, future scenarios, Afrofuturism, and science and tech policy. Michael. Greetings, everyone. Uh, thanks for that lovely intro, Kevin. Um, as far as uh, influence goes, uh, I guess my, my favorite example um, that actually doesn't go directly to, to technological innovation or scientific knowledge production, but it's, um, it's nevertheless incredibly um, uh, an incredibly powerful uh, instance. So uh, it's a, that great anecdote that I'm sure everyone on this Zoom has heard of before, um, in which um, uh, Michelle Nichols is uh, on the cusp of quitting uh, the, the Star Trek uh, series, right? The original series in, in the 60s, and apparently is uh, in attendance at, a, at an NAACP event and has let a small circle of friends know uh, her plans. And she gets this call from someone purporting to be uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, doesn't believe it, uh, ultimately it turns out to be the case. And he implores her to, to not quit, right? Um, and he tells her that this is the only show that he lets his family watch, that he allows his daughters to watch because it has this incredible virtue of actually showing black people not only existing, but thriving in a, in a distant future. It was a, a great beacon of hope and again, even though it does not uh, go directly to technological innovation, I have to imagine that that's spurred on many individuals to not only not uh, give up on life generally, but probably to try to create things, artifacts, systems, et cetera, to make life better for, for all people. Great example. Uh, next up is Tim Chang, a venture capitalist of Mayfield Partners, who's going to talk about tech's influence on Silicon Valley. Tim, do you have a, a favorite uh, sci-fi influence anecdote or example? Yeah. Um, good friend of mine, Elliot Pieper, writes near-term speculative fiction. And I am just blown away by our copy chats, literally just speculating on what might happen with, um, you know, unintended consequences of how social media feeds, search algorithms are used, pops up in his, in his novel. He's so prolific. He'll pump out the novel three months later and he'll cite the exact thing we talked about and then take it to um, even further extrapolated conditions. And it's just mind blowing. And I really love that because also it's helping me inform my own investment thesis uh, in terms of what we're seeing um, use cases of technology, you know, both intended and unintended. Um, so that's as real time as it gets. So that's just an example of my interaction, you know, with a pretty prolific sci-fi author I'm a fan of. So prolific that Elliot has a new novel out this month. I believe it's called Reaper. Um, 
another sci-fi novelist uh, that you may have heard of, Corey Doctorow. Um, he is a sci-fi novelist, journalist, and special advisor to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, my alma mater as well. Um, and his most recent sci-fi for adults is uh, Radicalized and Walk Away. Corey. Hey. So my, I, I, I thought you were going to keep going, but I, <laughs> that's fine. I know what my brag sheet sounds like. Um, so I, I think my favorite uh, inspiration is as an ethos. Uh, again, not not a specific gadget because the gadget involved was really dumb. Uh, so in in Will and Gibson's Sprawl trilogy, we see people who are doing what I call seizing the means of computation. They're, they're taking these modified computers and using them to do things on networks that are owned by large corporations and uh, who collaborate with states in ways that are adverse to their interest. And they're repurposing them to do things that promote their interests. Some of them are criminal and some of them are not. And that was an idea that was sort of latent in tech circles, but was not really present in the wider world, the idea of... Um, of uh, uh, people being able to take control of their technology and uh, rather than abolishing it. And in fact, the major symbol we had for this was the misapprehension about the Luddites, right? The idea that the Luddites had been anti-loom, which is like calling Osama bin Laden anti-aviation or the Boston Tea Party anti-tea, right? The, rather that, you know, the, the Luddites were really concerned with how uh, technology was used socially, like who who reaped the benefits of it and who was in control of it. They didn't. They weren't. They weren't opposed to looms themselves. And I think that Gibson really rescued from the scrap heap of history the idea that it is legitimate to respond to your objections to technology not by demanding its abolition but by demanding its reconfiguration and that's an idea that's very much alive today and i think key to our best uh fights right that it's i i'm, I'm not going to um, use amish as a pejorative here but there are people who want to change the way they use technology beyond refusal or small community scale uh um you know social pacts but who want actually broad scale technological config reconfiguration i trace that to gibson and as i said the actual technology is really dumb they're modifying these computers so that they can attack corporate networks but for some reason they don't um, remove the part of the computer that shocks them to death if they're if they're discovered doing it which seems to me like one of those major omissions that you might want to reconsider all right, moving on, we have Malka Older, who is a writer, an aid worker, and a sociologist. Uh, she's the author of The Sentinel Cycle, uh, a trilogy that started with Infomocracy, which was a finalist for the Hugo Best Series uh, Award of 2018. Um, and she is also currently a faculty associate at the School for the Future of Innovation here at Arizona State University. Malka. Yeah, thanks. So um, as a social scientist, I'm also going to kind of go with these these ideas. And I'm going to borrow a quote from Walida Marisha of the Octavius Brood movement, um, who says that all activism is science fiction, because we need to imagine these these better worlds and, and kind of link that into something that um, Ursula Le Guin said, which is that capitalism, um, and we can also replace that with other things, not that I think capitalism is unimportant, but there are a lot of other things that also seem this way, but these things seem inescapable. The systems that we live in seem inescapable, but so did the divine right of kings. And so I'm thinking about uh, the book, the original book, Utopia, for example, and I am not personally a big fan of utopias um, because they're static and narratively boring. And also, I, I don't think that there's such a thing as a perfect system where we can just stop. Uh, we have to keep um, improving and innovating and adjusting. But this idea at the time that, that we should be, we can imagine something better than where we are, and that that's something that we should be working for, uh, is one that's really powerful and that we, one that we should be returning to in that spirit. All right. And finally, we have Cheryl Vint. She's a science fiction scholar and editor. She's the director of the Speculative Fiction and Cultures of Science program at UC Riverside. Uh, and I highly recommend her MIT Essential Knowledge series entry on sci-fi and her science fiction, A Guide for the Perplexed, if you want a really big picture of these topics. Cheryl? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, and thank you to my fellow panelists for really interesting and intriguing um, answers to this question. 
And um, like most of you, I'm really interested in these kind of connections and feedback loops in terms of their social consequences. So I'm really happy to see things like unintended consequences highlighted, the importance of who appears in the future highlighted, the idea that we can reconfigure, reconfigure how we use and who owns technology highlighted. So my example is, um, uh, comes out of my geeky experience that I love it when we started getting things like Siri that could talk to you. I love it that if you say things to her like be me up Siri or open the pod bay doors Siri that she has answers to those questions or it I should really say has answers to those questions. And the reason I like that example is less that the answers are particularly inspiring or that um, you know that I feel that these technologies are leading us towards the sort of 2001 hell future, but more because I think the very fact that, that the technology has answers to those questions shows how pervasively the science fiction imaginary shapes technological design. And, and for me, that's important because it highlights exactly the questions my fellow panelists have already highlighted. It really matters that we think about equity. It really matters that we think about inclusivity in terms of te technological design. And it's very clear that science fiction is informing these kinds of questions. And so highlighting the kind of science fiction that helps us think about the social consequences of technology is thereby all the more important. Great, and your, your example also uh, relevant is that Jeff Bezos says he was directly inspired by uh, the speaking computer on Star Trek Next Generation uh, when, when asking his engineers to build Alexa. Um, so I will end uh, with my own favorite example, not because I was happy with the influence, but I think it's a good example of how one can have an influence on policy. And that is the influence of sci-fi on Ronald Reagan era uh, policy. Um, there are two of note. One is a bunch of sci-fi writers, uh, including Heinlein and Niven and Pornell, getting together and uh, advocating for uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative, basically a bunch of space lasers uh, in space to shoot down missiles. This actually turned into a big billion dollar, billions of dollars boondoggle for the government that went nowhere and was not a good idea, but it showed uh, the influence. And the other was war games, which uh, scared Reagan and he took it to his joint chiefs um, and said, could we get hacked like this? And they were like, maybe. And that led to both our first hacking law and DOD's first basic cybersecurity policy. So again, not necessarily policies I was a fan of, but it does show how sci-fi can have an influence. So I'm gonna spend about five minutes giving a, a sort of potted history of sci-fi and its influence to give us some signposts to work with and give the audience uh, a shared context on the topic. And then we'll get into a more traditional panel discussion. Uh, we, I, I will try to pepper in a few questions from the Q&A feature in Zoom, uh, if anyone wants to use that. But um, where to start? Well, there is a debate over when sci-fi really started. What's the first sci-fi? A lot of people would say Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but I think sci-fi became relevant to tech development uh, really in the late 1800s and early 1900s with uh, Edgar Allan Poe, Jules Verne, and H.G. Wells, um, who amongst other things uh, sent people to the moon in their stories, respectively using a balloon, a bullet with people in it, and a made up mineral called caverite because they didn't have the technology at the time to really conceive of what a technically realistic trip to the moon would look like. Um, but the people who were directly inspired by reading those books as younger people, including people like uh, Werner von Braun and Robert Goddard, uh, they actually went on to invent chemical rocketry um, and eventually build the Saturn rocket that put the Apollo astronauts on the moon. It is an important side note to, to note that Von Braun also sent V2 rockets to London during the Blitz as a Nazi, um, perhaps illustrating the double-edged sword of this influence. Um, so we saw advancing scientific knowledge, including around rocketry, uh, in turn inspire a new wave of pulp sci-fi writers in the 20s and 30s focused more on scientific realism. So say, um, instead of uh, John Carter in Edgar Rice Burroughs' Mars books just magically teleporting to Mars, you actually had spaceships and spacesuits and things like that. This so-called golden age uh, of this so-called hard sci-fi approach uh, 
was exemplified by the magazine Astounding Science Fiction, still published today as Analog. Um, it's mid-century editor John W. Campbell uh, and stories written by the so-called big three sci-fi authors of, of the time period. And those were Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, and Arthur C. Clarke, all of whom came from technical backgrounds. Um, worth noting, this golden age was not a golden age for everyone, women and people of color, although definitely contributing to the field, were marginalized both in their attempts at authorship and their portrayals in the fiction itself. And notably, Campbell was a virulent racist. Um, Asimov, uh, you'll know best from his iRobot series of stories, which originated the three laws of robotics that are still referenced today, and his foundation series, which amongst other things, apparently was a fundamental influence on Elon Musk's mission to make humans multi-planetary. Clark, it's probably best known, amongst other things, for writing 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was a huge influence on the public's vision and science's pursuit of space travel and AI, as well as things like tablet computers. Um, he's also known for conceiving of the idea of geosynchronous communication satellites. Uh, and then there's Robert Heinlein, um, Strangers in a Strange, Stranger in a Strange Land, Starship Troopers, um, whose biggest influence was probably political. Uh, his vision of space as an endless frontier for human expansion and liberation, paired with his staunch anti-communism, made him a key literary forebear of modern libertarianism, second only to Ayn Rand, probably. Um, in fact, the libertarian slogan of the lunar revolutionaries in his influential libertarian classic, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, uh, which was Tan Staffel, or There Ain't No Such Thing as a Free Lunch, was also the first official motto of the Libertarian Party when it was founded, something I just learned. Um, and for better or for worse, he too was a huge influence on both Musk's and Jeff Bezos's space visions. Um, but no science fiction had more influence on Bezos and probably on anyone than the original Star Trek in the late 60s. Uh, we still don't have transporters or warp drive or replicators. But we do now have cell phones that were inspired by Star Trek communicators. We have tablets inspired by the electronic clipboard uh, in, in the original series or the tablet computers in the next generation. Uh, and as I just noted, Alexa, uh, Bezos says, was directly inspired by the talking computer in the next generation. Um, also, Star Trek and its, its uh, successors is also probably the best recruiting ad for STEM careers ever devised, uh, which is a key important influence. But while Star Trek The Next Generation was on TV in the 80s and 90s, another influential trend was brewing in print sci-fi called cyberpunk. Cyberpunk tossed out the spaceships and aliens and shiny, exciting far futures of the Golden Age, focusing less on outer space and more on cyberspace, a term coined in the sci-fi of William Gibson and popularized in his novel Neuromancer. Writers like him and Bruce Sterling and Neil Stevenson excuse me, Neil Stevenson, um, they drew on the darker, more political, and, and thankfully much more diverse new wave of science fiction that arose in the 60s and 70s. Uh, writers like Sam Delaney, Ursula Le Guin, J.G. Ballard, Harlan Ellison, and painted a more dystopian picture of a globally networked near future of polluted megacities where the lines were blurred between what was real and, and what was virtual, what was biological and what was technological, and where multinational corporations and criminal networks were supplanting nation states. Cyberpunk not only gave us a basic language and concepts for understanding our current and future information tech space, cyberspace, avatars, metaverse, cryptocurrency. Um, but also, as we'll talk about today, it directly inspired people in Silicon Valley to build a lot of the tech it portrayed. Okay, I've been talking for a long time, so I'll just add one more important post-cyberpunk influence worth noting. And that's the idea of the singularity, which was originated by a science fiction writer, Werner Vinge, in the 90s, both in an influential essay uh, and in his sci-fi novels, like Fire Upon the Deep. Vinge imagined the singularity, and now a number of scientists like, say, Ray Kurzweil, who now is a senior executive at Google, uh, have theorized in depth that we are fast approaching a singular point where computers will become more intelligent than humans and essentially become the next species of fast evolving, self-improving intelligent life, perhaps interfacing with humans in a way that makes them supernaturally intelligent as well, superhumanly rather. Um, this is one of the inspirations for Elon Musk's 
uh, Neuralink, which is actually named after a science fiction technology in Ian Banks's culture series, uh, or uh, the singularity may enable the uploading and then expansion of human intelligence through non-biological substrates, or, or it may lead to these super AIs simply outgrowing us and leaving us behind. Um, these ideas and related transhumanist and posthumanist ideas around our supposed future co-evolution with machine intelligence and biotech and the expansion of human consciousness are, are more than a little influential in tech circles, as, as our panelists will tell you. But as they'll also note, there is also a new energy around science fiction that one is much more diverse than in the past. Uh, we'll note especially uh, the movement around Afrofuturism and indigenous futures, um, but also science fiction that much more realistically tackles the, the much nearer term questions of how we're going to survive climate change and learn to peaceably govern ourselves here on earth. So that is uh, my brief history of sci-fi and its influence. So we are going to hit the panelists with some questions, and I'm going to start with Corey. Um, Neil Stevenson has described sci-fi influence as like a magnetic field that sort of aligns a bunch of people on a basic vision, less so than like a one-to-one, -one, someone saw something and then built it. Uh, it's more like his term, a hieroglyph, a, a shared symbol that draws people to it. Um, but there's a lot of different ways of thinking about this influence. And so, Corey, as a sci-fi writer, um, I'd, I'd love to hear how you would describe the operation of this, of this influence and, and how much of it is influence versus prediction. How do we parse this? Yeah, I think that there's something intrinsically fatalistic about the idea that science fiction writers can predict the future. I think that we spend way too much time theorizing uh, positive futures and negative futures and way too little time realizing that if we think we can, can we can predict the future, it means that nothing we do will affect the future, that we can just all go to bed because the future is arriving no matter what we do. And so I, I'm really uninterested in that Heinleinian project. I was once on a panel with Robert Silverberg where uh, he called Heinlein Robert A. Timeline, which I'm sure is an old joke of his, but the, you know, the, the frontispieces of many Heinlein books that I grew up reading had these incredibly detailed timelines of the future. And, you know, Asimov very famously premised his whole foundation series on the idea that uh, sufficiently skilled social scientists can predict the next 3000 years of history. Terrifyingly, we talk about the influence of science fiction on technology. Terrifyingly, there are a bunch of economists, notably Paul Krugman, who said that this is what inspired them to become a, an economist, right? The idea that if you just put the right inputs in place, the future will run as though it were on rails. Uh, it really, you know, it, it, it is a, a morally vacant position that excuses everyone of everything they do because they're just like filling their historically preordained role. So for me, science fiction is much more interesting when we think about it as a... Um, uh, a tool for inspiring or warning away from futures. You know, uh, Kevin, you and I were talking the other day about this and I brought up Heinlein's taxonomy. If only, uh, what if, and if this goes on, you know, the idea that we can warn people about things, that we can inspire people to do things, that we can make people think through the second and third order consequences of what they're contemplating, you know, um, there's this old uh, Gardner Dozois, I believe, saw that uh, the job of a science fiction writer is to consider the car and the automobile or, and the cinema and invent not just the uh, the drive-in, but infer the, the, uh, the um, sexual revolution that arises once you send teenagers in cars to drive-ins. And for me, I'm like, yeah, and then there's this like third order consequence that maybe we want to think about, which is that once uh, participating in the sexual revolution requires that you get government issued ID, we set the stage for a surveillance state and all kinds of measurement that were literally impossible right up into that moment. And and so, you know, that's what I hope we can do is is inspire people and warn people and make people think through second and third order consequences, not because they can predict them, but because they can, you know, if you think about well, if this happens, then that might happen, and then that other thing might happen. It at least gives you a, a, a sense of the scale of how an intervention might proceed, which might cause you to act with a little less hubris and a little less sort of move fast and break things and a little more attention to uh, fail safes and, um, you know, monitoring the progress of a thing that you release into the world so that you can see what it's doing and maybe change it if it's not behaving as predicted and so on. You know, I, I, I don't want, 
uh, Nostradamus out there. I, I want, you know, activists, uh, uh, people who change things. Great. Um, Cheryl, as, as the academic uh, who studies this stuff, I'm curious if you could tell us about how academics conceptualize the operation of this influence. And a related question, what the heck is a socio-technical imaginary? Sure. Um, so a socio-technical imaginary, that's um, Sheila Jasanoff's term. Um, and she's a, a sociologist who sort of studies um, science and technology and their um, influence on policy, their influence on, on social values, things like that. And uh, in the idea of the socio-technical socio imaginary, what she's interested in is sort of how visions of the future can sort of um, map out how people understand uh, the directions they want technology to go to change their lives. So, so I mean, I think some of the um, things we talked about in the, the, our first round around, for example, the importance of um, uh, 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 Uhura remaining on Star Trek that this is not necessarily like, because it's really important to imagine what communication officers look like, but it's important to imagine like, you know, what's a vision of this sort of spacefaring technology in the future that involves sort of uh, multiple ethnicities, multiple nations was part of the first sort of vision. And so it's a way of sort of thinking about science and culture in this more globalized kind of way. Uh, in terms of like where scholars want to study this stuff, there's there's a wide range and there's there's a lot of people's names I should mention and, and that's certainly not going to be all the names I, sh I should mention because so many people are doing interesting work. But I mean, I think it ranges from looking at the kind of um, direct influence kind of stuff we're talking about in the panel. Um, uh, a scholar like Colin Milburn, for example, has done like really interesting work looking at how um, the military takes certain cues for how it imagines like soldiers of the future from various science fiction texts and like, and then imports the kind of ideologies that are, inf that are informing like video game texts into how it's imagining the future of warfare, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Grant Wyckoff has this amazing book um, called The Perversity of Things that's about Hugo Gernsback and all his kind of editorials and his attempts to invent science fiction as a project in his editorials and what um, the perversity of things does is has all these footnotes where it contextualizes all the things that um, Gernsback is doing in terms of contemporary media ecologies but also um, contemporary to us media ecologies so we can kind of understand the history of these kind of influences. I think that a lot of what science fiction scholars are interested in doing is adding a lot more context to um, our understanding of certain texts or icons that maybe get celebrated in social media spaces or um, embraced by tech billionaires as we see more and more. So for example, you mentioned Werner von Braun and the sort of space race and rocket travel and that he was also working for the Nazis and bombing the UK. He was also like conducting research using slave labor. And so um, I'd say like that's one of the contexts that, that science fiction studies scholars are interested in adding in. And then sort of increasing the diversity of how we're talking about the field, right? Because there's a certain number of names that have this outside influence and, you know, Heinlein and his techno libertarianism, you, you've already sort of explicated how that worked, the sort of SDI thing. But I mean, what would it look like if, um, you know, tech inventors and, and uh, startup founders and corporate policymakers were taking their cues from like Malka Older and Cory Doctorow. We'd have like a really different vision of what tech should be doing in the world and who it should be serving in the world. And so I think that's one of the things that scholars always like to remind people is that there's more science fiction than the stuff that's out there uh, inspiring a kind of narrow pathway towards a certain kind of um, capitalist extractivist future. Malka Older and Cory Doctorow as the unacknowledged legislators of the future would, would certainly lead to a, a better one. And I'm not just saying that because you're on my panel. Um, Malka, uh, I, know, I know you have some feelings on, on this question. Um, utopian and dystopian visions in sci-fi have, have been very influential. One need only look at say 1984, and if you don't think that's sci-fi, come at me. Uh, it totally is. 
um, has been like so profoundly influential in discourse around government surveillance, for example, uh, or Star Trek and its vision of a of a more diverse, multi multiracial, multi planetary future, um, and and later in next generation, a, a more explicitly post capitalist future uh, has been really influential. Um, where do you see the role of of utopia and dystopia in in science and science fiction influence? Okay, so I actually really like both of those examples that you gave. I'm I'm not a big fan of like utopia in the sense of everything's perfect, we do nothing now. And I think most of the things that we call dystopias aren't. I do think 1984 is one of the few examples that's like, uh, it's, I mean, it's really grim and it's grim all the way through, all the way down. And, and it's also grim in a way that's like, you know, there's, there's some stuff in there that's a little unrealistic in terms of how it happens. Um, while all the motivations and the structures and everything are very realistic in terms of what are people people are attempting to do, right? Um, so I do classify that as a dystopia personally, and I think it's really valuable as that because I do think it's there as a warning and as an, and as a really well thought out example of if we take some of these these trends and these ways of thinking to an extreme, this is what it could end up being like, right? Um, and I think that's um, that's that's important because we do see people forgetting that uh, over and over again. So, and then on the other side, you know, as I said, utopia to utopian, like there's this spectrum that gets towards it, right? And I think that there's so much value in imagining stuff that is better than what we have um, and, and imagining it in complicated ways that says this will not be perfect, but these elements of it might be better or they will be better, but have these other drawbacks that we need to keep thinking of and working on. Um, and I think this goes also to the point uh, that Cheryl was making about having a diversity of visions of the future, because no one is going to get it right. If they do, it's going to be an accident and it also won't last very long because we are constantly changing. Um, then no, no, no single person is going to get this right. The world is too complicated. Humans are too complicated. We need lots of ideas of both, both what could be better and what could happen um, if we do not behave ourselves and if things go very wrong. So I think both of those things are really valuable. We just need lots of them from lots of different perspectives, from the people who will be at risk in lots of different ways um, and who have lots of different things to offer for those better solutions. Mm -hmm. I really like your point about how a lot of things that are claimed to be dystopian aren't. Um, for example, William Gibson used to say, I would say joke, but I, I mean, he, I think he meant it. Um, he viewed Neuromancer as a positive vision of the future because we had not nuked ourselves uh, into oblivion. Um, and I, I also uh, appreciate your point about how one can actually have a utopian vision in a book or a movie or whatever, while still having it be complexified by hard and difficult questions and bad things happening. Like I think Kim Stanley Robinson does this really well in his books around climate, where there are clearly horrible climate disasters happening, but he's able to take a hopeful view of how we're going to organize to try and address it and, and stem, stem the damage. Um, I would also say this is a feature of much of Corey's work. And so I'd love to ask you, Corey, you know, as a writer, perhaps more so than most, you often have a more expressly like pedagogic or, or activist perspective on, on what you're trying to accomplish. So like you are actually gunning for influence. Can, can you talk about how that works for you and, and what you're after when you're doing that? Yeah, so I, I like you, I've spent a lot of time in the trenches working on tech policy questions, which tend to be very abstract until it's too late. So it's not that tech policy questions are always abstract. There, there comes a point where like the problem of technology is really manifest and easy to understand because we're in the midst of whatever crisis it, it was inevitably going to precipitate. Ideally, we'd like people to intervene before the problems are so easy to see that you can no longer deny them. I mean, you can think of you can think of the um, climate emergency as having a, a dimension of this, right? In the '70s, even if Exxon had not decided to lie, cover up, and sow disinformation about climate, the the nature of the climate emergency, 
it might have been hard to just get people to take it as seriously as it needed to be taken because an invisible gas doing something over 50 year time scales is just hard to keep at top of mind all the time and understanding the consequences are hard to imagine but you know fiction is a kind of emotional fly through of these otherwise very dry and abstract discussions right you can talk all you want about the perils of surveillance and the way that being watched makes you uh not express your authentic self but you know that's a that's a very abstract argument especially when brought up against people who are like but having a camera in the lobby of this apartment building will keep people from peeing in the doorway uh, and when you add the word Orwellian to that discussion, you may not win the discussion anyway, but it, but at least you import by reference this very profound and moving and emotionally uh, um, significant and salient, not argument, but uh, feeling. Um, there's, a, there's an expression Kim Stanley Robinson uses, the structure of the feeling about, about what, is, what it's like to be watched. And you know that that I think is um, an important corrective here, uh, and it, it gets you to places that you don't get just by talking about the abstract arguments. Twenty years ago, uh, some Microsoft engineers presented at the Electronic Frontier Foundation about the risks of, um, or about the possibilities of trusted computing and remote attestation, which are subjects so kind of abstract that if I were to try and describe them to you now, it would be all we talk about for the rest of this program. But nevertheless, it poses some really significant risks as well as some major opportunities. And um, rather than, or, or in addition to writing about this in this very abstract way, I wrote a short story that was nominated for the Nebula called Ownzord that just tried to dig into those questions in a, in a much more fictionalized way. And, you know, the person who ran that program at Microsoft sent me a kind of grudgingly admiring email not long after to say like, I don't know how to rebut that argument, right? I, I don't know how to rebut the structure of the feeling that you've given people about this thing. Uh, and you kind of moved it to a domain where um, I am outgunned by you, even though I represent at the time a company that had 97% of the world's operating system market share and had just been convicted of being a monopolist by the Federal Trade Commission or the DOJ rather. And I worked for a, a nonprofit with like 11 employees, but he was like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to answer this using the resources of Microsoft. So, you know, it's a force multiplier in those discussions as well. I like that structure of the feeling. I, um, I think that one unfortunate structure of the feeling of a lot of sci-fi in the past was uh, one that imagined a future of default whiteness. Um, N.K. Jemisin, uh, amazing author, uh, uses an example, uh, a fairly modern example of the, the Divergent series and, and those movies. And those movies take place in Chicago, which is a like majority non-white city uh, today. But if you look at the future in those movies, they're all white. Um, and so uh, Nora uh, Jemison, she, she jokes, so like there must have been some sort of racial apocalypse between now and then that's implicit in this vision of the future where, where, where blackness sort of just isn't a thing. And, and we've seen, um, you know, although we certainly saw, saw it earlier uh, in sci-fi in, in the 70s, um, we've seen re recently a real resurgence of, of uh, Afrofuturist or African futurist um, visions of the future uh, to try and give us uh, that broader view uh, of a future that is not like a white supremacist future. Um, Michael, I was hoping since you, you're a specialist in this stuff, uh, can you give us a bit more color on uh, uh, the um, on Afrofuturism and its background and the difference between Afrofuturism and African futurism? Uh, and, and what kind of, how you're seeing this as a trend in, in sci-fi today? Sure, sure. And just for the record, I was in uh, Chicago just a few days ago and there are tons of black people and turned tons of Latinx folks walking around. So no worries right now. Um, great, great. But, but yes, in, in terms of Afrofuturism, I mean, huge, huge canopy under which now many, many, many forms of flowers are, are blooming. 
And so it's, um, from where I sit at least, extremely difficult to, um, to encapsulate um, such a, a broad uh, population and a diverse population of works and, um, and creatives. But, um, but a few things I think um, cut across and touch many of the works and many of the minds generating those works. And so one that's, um, that's pretty obvious to, to most people that have sampled the space, um, the, uh, the domain, is simply a foregrounding of uh, technological artifacts, uh, scientific knowledge production in such a, in such a manner as to, uh, to really simultaneously foreground the experiences lived presently and as well as future aspirations of, of Black people. Um, it's, it's not called Afrofuturism for, for nothing, in other words, right? So uh, a central focus on the experiences of people uh, who uh, occupy the, the African diaspora um, as they engage with, in some instances, or transformed into or somehow embody or transmute uh, techno-scientific um, uh, artifacts is, is one part of it. Um, a related part of it oftentimes is um, you know, a desired effect on uh, those that consume these works. So there's a kind of, as I like to say sometimes, a raising of consciousness, um, both in that classic sense, that R-A-I-S-I-N-G. Um, so giving, uh, giving more folks who may not be spending all of their time in STEM programs or STS programs, a sense of the, the political significance of techno-scientific uh, activities, um, you know, developments in that space, but then also raising in the sense of the R-A-Z-I-N-G sense, where perceptions of what is of significance right now and what might be in the future is also chopped up in very interesting and useful ways, in my opinion. Um, I would, um, would also say uh, that, uh, you know, I move towards your, uh, I think it's your second question there, Kevin, with, with a little bit of trepidation. I mean, the one because I know Nettie, and she's a um, she's a formidable person. So I don't I don't want to uh, take her her thoughts um, and expressions around African futurism and um, misstate uh, them or misrestate them. Um, and so I guess the, the best way to to respond right now would be to say that um, as far as the distinction goes, if there is one, that uh, African futurism is really uh, kind of bountiful development and the, the internal uh, pan-Africanist discussions around Afrofuturism that is kind of a piece with, uh, with many of the discussions that, um, that many of us are having right now about the, the waning influence of American culture around the world. Um, in part, I understand what, she's do what she is doing with that term, having generated it, created it effectively. I understand that is um, kind of marking out uh, a territory that um, uh, kind of flags her presence as both uh, Nigerian and, and American, um, flags her concern with being, if she, in the absence of this kind of incursion, her, uh, her resistance to being grouped in with a bunch of authors who might not have much more in common than being black and having written science fiction. I'm marking that as, as um, in some instances, a little problematic. And then thirdly, I think she uh, and those who take up the term as well are thinking about what um, you know, African voices from the continent uh, might be able to contribute to their own communities as well as to the broader conversation about blackness and futurity. And in that sense, I think um, you know, African futurism it's kind of uh, a current day manifestation of some of the things that Amir Baraka used to talk about, you know, maximum internal strife uh, within the bounds of an otherwise civilized discussion among black folks about um, what, um, what they want to see in the world and how they want to be living in the future. Mm. Um, and, and Nettie, of course, is, is Nettie Okorafor, um, noted sci-fi author. Uh, her Binti series in particular is amazing. Um, I'd love to switch gears and talk about the outsized influence that science fiction has had on the tech industry uh, in the past and, and in the present. And so for that, I'm going to turn to uh, Tim, who is so Silicon Valley that he resides in Miami now, I believe. Um, 
uh, Tim, can you can you tell us uh, about how you see the tech uh, sci-fi influence show up in the tech world um, today? Yeah, um, it's always been there in my career. I remember early days, entrepreneurs would show up with uh, Snow Crash, put it on my desk and be like, this, this is our business plan. So <laughs> there's been many of cases like that. Um, more near term, it's been like uh, Charlie Strasser's book, um, Holding State, around AR, uh, NFTs, metaverse, you know, um, all virtual world type of fictions from cyberpunk have showed up uh, big time recently. The difference uh, I think is then um, how we think about the incentive models and business models. And this is a point I wanted to bring up where um, a lot of the sci-fi I read growing up, you know, wasn't a lot of exploration of who funded this stuff and what were their agendas behind it. And that's the part I'm actually really interested in. I think technology leads to use cases and applications that are um, unintended consequences of the human experience, the structure, the feeling we talked about, but the financial business model applications drive how it's wielded, how it's scaled, um, who gets access to it. That part's really interesting. And so, um, you know, Elliot Pieper, like I talked about before, explores a lot of the damage that not just technology could do, but when technology is wielded, perhaps with um, unethical business models. I, for one, think that free and ad-based is now officially an unethical business model when we have algorithmic content creation because it's fundamentally pits the end user versus customer interests against each other. So I just, I won't look at those business models anymore. I'd rather go try to imagine web three type business models. And I know it's a running meme now where it's all DAOs and NFTs and everything else. But, um, you know, aside from sort of the, the mercenary get rich quick aspect of it, I do think there could be some really interesting applications of certain sectors that didn't monetize well before, like things like Reddit or social media, you know, um, with, with business models that, like I said, were not quite as ethical with maybe things that are a little more aligned between the end user and, and the economic interests. So that's what I'm really curious about seeing now and wanting to see science fiction of the near term explore more of those linkages between business models chosen and technology scale out. Oh, Kevin, you're muted. Had to do it at least once. Um, uh, a couple of follow-ups. One, you mentioned Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. Um, very influential. Notably, my company renamed itself after a technology in that book, The Metaverse. Um, but so his, 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 his VR vision has been very influential. His vision around cryptocurrency and cryptonomicon has been very influential. Um, uh, he he was Jeff Bezos's first employee in Blue Origin, uh, doing research about new ways of projecting people into space that ultimately turned into his sci-fi book, um, Seven Eves. Uh, oh, Diamond Age was hugely influential on people's visions of nanotechnology. Um, why do you think Neil Stevenson has had such a direct impact on technology thinking? Like, I, it doesn't seem like any individual has had such a varied impact since, since Werner Wells, um, you know, not to, not to, not to make his head grow too big. I mean, you know, he is Neil Stevenson. He's pretty impressive. But anyway, I'm curious what you think of that. Uh, and then a very different question. Um, you know, we were chatting and we were talking about this, this concept of long-termism and, and the idea that uh, we this is a um, idea, a philosophy uh, that is apparently very popular in Silicon Valley around whatever we need to do to maximize um, the, over the, the, the long-term survival of the human race so that we can ultimately flourish and maybe upload our brains and ultimately have trillions of human or post-human intelligences around the galaxy um, that we really need to prioritize that, uh, which then leads to deprioritizing everyone here today. Um, I don't know, I'm probably answering my own question or at least airing my own critique, but I, I'm curious where you see that kind of techno solutionist or long-termist thinking uh, in the Valley. But let's start with Neil Stevenson. Um, I was always a fan of, of Neil's because I think there were economic, you know, kind of concerns in there. A lot of what he'd written reminded me of like anarcho-capitalism or, you know, those sorts of things that take into account, again, what happens with these sort of 
societal business models, right? So I don't know. I think economics is at the core of a lot of how we envision these technologies getting rolled out. That old quote, what was it? Uh, future is here, just not evenly distributed. That directly is talking about it. Access, who gets to have it, who pays for it, who funds it, what strings come with that, right? So those explorations are really interesting. I think Neil touches on some of those things. But um, for your other question, uh, I'll be honest, I always had an allergic reaction to technology uber alles. Whatever problem comes up, you know, we'll just have some abundance thing that comes through technology. I don't think it's that simple. I think technology is a power tool like anything else, like psychedelics or nuclear weapons or firearms. It's not good or bad inherently. It's what intention and what, again, business model and agenda do you wield it with, right? And so that is one of the most powerful things about science fiction is exploring um, different edge cases with different types of these models and, and, and into them. Um. Moving over to Cheryl, you know, you've you've studied the sort of post-humanist and transhumanist um, concepts, imaginaries, uh, sort of coming out of cyberpunk and, and singularitarian sci-fi. I'm, I'm curious if you could add some context or insight here. Sure, I can add some opinions, if nothing else. Um, so, I mean... In terms of Stevenson, I, I like his work. I've read all of his work. Um, I think one of the reasons perhaps he has the outside influence, outsized influence is because in some ways the style of his work harkens back to a kind of older science fiction where he actually explains in a lot of detail how technologically things are supposed to be worked through. So he's interested in that kind of tech detail, which I presume appeals to audiences who are approaching it thinking they might want to actually build these things. But I also think, and this gets us, sort of circles us back to the socio-technical imaginary that you asked about at the beginning and, and sort of wider questions of social influence. One of the ways um, he became very influential in this space is because of his essay, Innovation Starvation, about the kind of need for science fiction to have these positive big project examples that would inspire people to sort of um, build these things. But exactly what that essay doesn't talk about is sort of the question of funding, right? Like what's the business model, uh, the sort of um, critiques that, that Tim is bringing up. And then, um, you know, he his citing the sort of hieroglyph idea that science fiction can inspire these big projects that's um, discussed frequently, but much earlier, Octavia Butler also was um, interested in space travel. And she was interested in space travel precisely because she thought that a big project like this would force humans to come together and overcome their differences and figure out ways not to be so racist and homophobic and sexist because we would have to combine our talents to do this kind of project. So there is that question of sort of like which visions of the future are being picked up and amplified and to what ends. And I think in terms of the Silicon Valley connection to science fiction is very much in these sort of narrowly conceived maximum profit um, sort of tr uh, transcending like cyberpunk gets understood as transcending embodiment. And we're going to have this like immortal future where we have these superpowers because we're living in computers. Um, how exactly like what those computers are running on and who's maintaining them. These are questions that don't tend to get asked. And, and, and so who actually like, gets to get uploaded. Yeah. Who, well, I mean, again, yes, exactly. So these questions of like inclusivity and um, a different kind of a social imaginary around technology. So I'll just say one more point and then I'll, I'll shut up. Uh, but it's something I really wanted to make sure I said in this conversation, which is when we are talking about this feedback loop um, between sort of science and technology and science fiction, I keep amplifying this question of like, who's science fiction? Um, because I think one of the things that we wanna look at how science fiction itself has become more diverse over the last couple of decades it's required us to recognize different ways of understanding science, ways of understanding science that are coming out of indigenous culture, ways of understanding science as not sort of shiny, well-funded projects, but like science fiction is making do as jerry-rigged and sort of repurposed technologies coming out of people that are um, writing from really um, places that have been impoverished by colonialism and they're like, you know, figuring out ways to repurpose 
um, consumerist technology to sort of fight rising tides and, and uh, climate change. So we have to change our ideas of like what we're recognizing as science and technology to make this feedback space as diverse as science fiction itself has started to become. Cheryl, I, I wonder what you what you make of this, though, right? I mean, it's it's extremely miraculous to me that uh, that Stevenson is as widely trafficked as he is, in part because each one of these things is like <laughs> the Bible, right? This is the Bible. This is seven hundred pages, and I think the the last ten years worth of his writing, they, it's it's a it's serialized Bibles, right? Um, and so it's, uh, there's something going on here. As a physics major myself, I want to say as well that it's got something to do with his bona fides, right? Like the people that are really into him, they know his background. And he, you know, he constantly reminds us of this in the writings as well. Um, I, once I got to page 50 in this most recent one, I was like, I don't know if I can do it you. And then he dropped in a little reference to an old physics textbook. And I was like, oh, yes, yes, I remember now why I'm in this. And I think that's a part of it. It's extremely nerdy in a very particular kind of way. And um, he, he speaks to his people. Yeah, yeah I would agree entirely. Action. I was just going to say, he also writes great action for everyone else, or at least he used to. I'm a little bit behind, but like, you know, I got into him with Snow Crash and it's, uh, you know, it's it at the time. And it, yeah, his later ones are a bit different, but it had not only action and not only like, heroes and weirdness and interesting things but it had very much that the punk aesthetic of like there are some people who are on the inside of the cyber revolution or the inside of their side and both and um i think that was very fascinating to people and we're in a very different place now in terms of who is in the metaverse um but you know there, there are different things going on in terms of what needs to be subverted and what kind of heroes and, and, and I think more than heroes, what kind of collectives we need. But uh, I think, you know, he's got that appeal of, of great storytelling in addition to all that technical stuff, which probably, you know, the thing that, that grabs some people is, is pushing the other people and then he'll come back and have a great fight scene and hmm. balance it out. I, uh, well, oh, go ahead. I wanted to say that I, I think that a broader term for what he's doing is techno realism. And I think that it's easy to dismiss techno realism as just being technically correct. Uh, but I think that it's about uh, the split that happens with every technological innovation in the science fiction we write about it, where the technology is so well understood that you can no longer treat it as a metaphor, and you have to treat it as a thing in the world. And so, you know, if you think about the cyberpunk of, of Gibson's era, right, computers are literally a metaphor. Like if you ask Gibson, what is what is the uh what is cyberspace he says it's the place i thought people's bodies were trying to enter when i went to video arcades and saw them thrusting their chests at the screen right it is a pure metaphor and today when you write about vr you are not writing about a metaphor you're writing about a thing and it's a thing that you can't slide past your audience like i think that we're probably at the point now where westerns are basically metaphors because we don't have a lot of experience with them but there's a limit to how far you can stretch the metaphor right if you're at a plot point a juncture in your storytelling we were like i need to get this guy out of there do you think people know whether horses can fly i'm just going to make the horse fly right no one's going to notice it'll be fine right that that people would react justifiably as though you had done something really weird but you know you could pull it off <laughs> but you, yeah i was gonna say that you know in so many of our stories particularly like kind of techno thrillers which bruce sterling calls uh, a science fiction novel with the president in it uh that that in our in our techno thrillers we often have things like they've only got four hours to break the encryption but their estimate says that it's going to take three and a half uh, or four and a half hours to break the encryption. And the thing is that if you don't understand encryption, that might sound like a really cool ticking bomb. But if you do understand encryption, then what you what you go from is saying like, as, as, as my understanding goes, anything that we use to encrypt anything, if it's implemented in a way that is halfway competent, would require all the hydrogen atoms in the universe to be turned into computers and to do nothing until the end of the universe but try and guess the key and they would probably run out of universe before they ran out of keys and it makes no sense and so you have to figure out where your story is in which the things about encryption that are real in the world and not the things you hope your audience don't uh, understand about encryption are the thing that you turn the drama on 
And I think that this is what, what Stevenson does, is he leans into the actual technical characteristics of technologies that are usually at the juncture of becoming well understood to us. And then he finds in them plot points that don't require that you hand wave away the technical characteristics, but in fact turn on those technical limitations and capabilities in surprising ways that are only available to people who do have that, that deep understanding of the technology. So it's not just that he gets it right. I mean, getting it right is easy. Uh, uh, James D. McDonald once told me that if you ever want to put a gun in your story and you don't want gun weirdos to tell you how you got it wrong, just put the word modified in front, in front of it, right? He used his modified Walter PPK to, you know, blow, shoot the lock off and they'll just, they'll tie themselves into knots, figuring out what incredibly clever modification you had in mind. And they'll just credit you with so much like gun lore that they'll worship you instead of nitpicking you. So getting it right is like relatively easy, but making stories that turn on your technical understanding where your technical understanding is deep and correct is hard and produces these Bibles that people actually <laughs> lean into. Um, I mean, uh, we are at time. I'm going to wrap it up in like a minute, but one just to add there, I, I think, for example, like the geoengineering technology in Neil Stevenson's new book, Terminal Shock, or in Elliot's uh, book, Veil, or or the, the governance structures and geoengineering stuff in Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future, like those are clearly not metaphors. The, that is them extrapolating and being very hopeful about like what we might actually do in a very real situation uh, here on planet Earth right now. And that is where I'm hoping we will continue to see uh, a positive influence from science fiction um, going forward. Thank you all for making the time for this conversation. It was a lot of fun. Uh, again, this is the first in a series of applied sci-fi events. Um, I, we have not set the date for the next one, but we will soon. Uh, have a great day. Thank you, everybody.